Well, hi, everyone, and um, thanks for tuning in. I was, I was glad to be invited back on to Ancient Origins, and um, today we would like to discuss Luxor Temple in Egypt. The temple has this amazing atmosphere, so I just wanted to describe a little bit about the site, the area. If you've um, visited a cathedral or a church that has this very still feeling in the air, um, Luxor has that, but I would say by orders of, of magnitude. So it has this amazing, um, palpable atmosphere. And my interest is really, where are the most um, powerful ancient sites that we can still visit? And Luxor is relatively intact. I mean, that's the magic of Egypt, where these sites were covered by sand. They've been so well preserved in comparison to other countries. So you can really sort of travel back in time. So it was known in the Egyptian language as the Southern Sanctuary founded in, in or around 1400 BCE, but probably built on the site of a smaller, earlier temple. And this is what we see in Egypt. Even um, the temples that we go to, which are thousands of years old, they are still built on earlier and earlier temples. And it does seem that they're still pushing the dates back on just how far some of those smaller temples would go. And... To the rear of the temple are, are chapels built by um, Tutmosis III and Alexander. That was, um, so during the Roman era, the temple and its surroundings were a leg legendary fortress and the home of the Roman government in the area. The Luxor temple that we see today um, had begun to be excavated by Professor Gaston Maspero after 1884. And... Um, the excavations were carried out sporadically until 1960 because over time, and you can see the, the modern day street level, you actually go down um, quite a few steps to get to the temple. So over the thousands of years, basically the rubbish and um, human occupation had built up over the temple. So probably just the tops of um, the columns were protruding. So they had a lot of uh, work to do to uncover. And... One of the, the good names, certainly in the alternative um, history scene, Egyptological circles, is um, John Anthony West. And I'd recommend this book um, to anyone that's, that's going to visit Egypt because it gives a good um, sort of an unbiased historical perspective that you could say the traditional academic point of view. But it also combines the... Um, the sort of questions, because there are a lot of questions about these sites still, and particularly in terms of um, the symbolism of ancient Egypt, which I'd like to go into in a bit more detail, because particularly when we're talking about Luxor Temple, um, symbolism is something that's been studied there quite extensively. So we can start to see a little bit into the minds, perhaps, of the ancient Egyptians. But one author's work... Um, that's worth looking at, if, certainly if you're interested in engineering or the precision, because there's a lot of things, and particularly it's been mentioned on the Ancient Aliens show, um, Christopher Dunn, who I've done tours with and spoke with the other day, he um, doesn't mind me just referencing his work. So he's an engineer, and he um, works with lathes and, and lasers for um, cutting granite so he's he's well placed to understand the magnitude of the work that the ancient Egyptians were carrying out so he took a photo of the Ramesses statue which you'll be able to see and if you split the photo in half and fold one side onto the other the perfection is down to the millimeter I mean it's a, almost a, a mirror image and he also um cut the photo in half and then measured the points on each side. And as you come down the different points of the face here, 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 it's millimetre perfect. So it would be incredibly difficult to do to get this millimetre perfect both sides from the central plane just by um, hand and eye coordination. So it's how, how did they um, achieve this level of um, precision? It boggles the mind. And so... Um, he says, so what does the, the face of uh, Ramesses have in common with a modern precision engineering object, such as an automobile, has flowing contours with distinct features that are perfectly mirrored one side to the other? The fact that one side of Ramesses' face is a perfect mirror image to the other implies that precision measurements have, have had to be used in its creation. 
means that the statue was carved in intricate detail to create precise three-dimensional surfaces. The jaw lines, eyes, nose and mouth are symmetrical and were created using a geometric scheme that embodies the Pythagorean triangle as well as the golden rectangle and golden triangle and that's all encoded in the granite the sacred geometry of the ancients. And you can read more about Chris's work on geezerpower.com. But the author that's inspired uh, John Anthony West and myself um, is Schwala de Lubitz, and he lived from 1887 to 1961. And he was a French occultist, student of sacred geometry, an Egyptologist, known for his 12-year study of the art and architecture of the Temple of Luxor. And he wrote a book, The Temple in Man. Now, I would say that his work is, is quite hard going. Um, it's very deep philosophy. So it's not something you can just kind of pick up and, and work through um, quickly. I mean, I'd consider myself um, pretty well read and, and traveled. But just on one page in this book, the, the sort of deep level of thought can each um, sentence or paragraph can sort of make me think about new concepts for 10 or 15 minutes sometimes so it's something that you you can work through I mean I, I definitely think it has value um, his insights after spending 12 years in in Luxor definitely resonate very strongly with me having visited there a number of times so he he um, was studying the temples of Thebes in detail and developed the symbolist approach to ancient Egypt he argued that Egyptian temples were used for mystical initiations, and that their design incorporated symbolism expressing a belief system that combined religion, philosophy, art and science. And this is um, seems to be where perhaps we've gone a little off, off track these days, that we've split off science from what we would term religion. But, I mean, we would look at ancient Egypt and it's kind of considered a pagan religion. But there are many parallels to um, the philosophy and the spirituality of India. So it's this kind of um, different approach that we can use for, for self-improvement. And the symbolist approach, when we look at the hieroglyphs and how they've designed these temples, um, seems to have a kind of effect on the subconscious, which we look at shortly. And there was something that I wanted to read read to you from uh, Gary Latchman, who's, who's another interesting author that's come onto the scene recently, looking at these kind of subjects. And he references the, the kind of sophistication that's demonstrated through um, Schwaller's work. So he says that phi is more than a central item in classical architecture, it is the mathematical archetype of the manifest universe. Schwaller linked phi to the orbit of the planets, the proportions of Gothic cathedrals, and the forms of plants and animals. It was a form constant, a blueprint for reality, you could say, a law of creation, and the Egyptians knew it. And that's what we can, when we're studying these sites in this level of detail, we can start to see the sophistication that's involved with what they've created. And it's often, often overlooked. This is the point, that there's a lot more to discover. So the Egyptians knew much else. The procession of the equinoxes, the circumference of the globe and the secrets of Pi. The knowledge of the Egyptians indeed made the Greeks seem like children. Their forgotten mathematical wisdom led Schwaller increasingly to realise that Egyptian civilization must be far older than we suspect. The clear evidence of water erosion on the Sphinx, as investigated by Robert Schock, also suggests that. He concluded... But their knowledge may have been inherited from vanished Atlantis. But more important than any of those conclusions was his growing conviction that the Egyptians had a radical different consciousness from ours. They viewed the world symbolically, seeing in nature a writing conveying truths about the metaphysical forces behind creation. The netters, or gods as, as we see them perhaps wrongly, it was a vision Schwaller believed we desperately need to regain. And at the centre of this vision was conscious man, the king. For the ancient Egyptians, conscious man was the crown and aim of the universe. But conscious man was not man as we know him. He was the individual in whom the intelligence of the heart has awakened. And Schwaller in his writings talks a lot about this kind of heart-based emotional intelligence. 
So it's um, rather than a kind of egotistical intelligence or just um, this kind of left brain thinking that we use for driving cars and operating computers, by developing um, the heart through um, practices, you tend to get, you could say, awaken empathy. So when you're thinking about things, perhaps you'll look at it from another person's perspective, not just your own, and maybe it'd be easier to reach a compromise. And it's a subject that goes like many layers to that subject. But this is something that happened to him from spending 12 years at the temple. And I know these, um, if you haven't visited these kind of places, it all sounds a bit, a bit obscure or strange. And this is why I always encourage people to visit the temples, ancient sites, spend time in nature, because it's only through direct experience that we can really understand what I'm, I'm saying perhaps today or what these authors um, have left us, this legacy from Schwaller. And then um, we may find that, that life changes for the better. But I thought it would be good to share a couple of experiences from people that have actually visited the temple to give you an idea of the kind of powerful effect it has on you. One lady on um, one of our recent tours as, as we were leaving, she, she was just sort of crying, crying because she felt so happy. There was this sense of peace and stillness and, and just kind of getting away from the world and all this craziness that we experience. So she, she just wanted to stay there for much longer and I knew exactly how she felt because I always feel a little sad when the time's up and we have to to move on but um, one quote uh, Robert Baval who many of you may have heard of his his brother who I've traveled um, through Egypt Jean Paul said to me as you know I've been to Luxor many times but my first visit with my school in 1958 was sheer amazement it still has this effect every time I visit at night he likes it as well is one of the most impressive sights I've ever witnessed. And Sadat, who's a, an Egyptian friend, says, one of the most energetic places in Upper Egypt, especially at night. The first time I visited, I felt like I can jump really high and do stuff that my body and mind is not so used to thinking or doing. But Karen uh, from Australia, who is a lovely lady that I managed to walk through the temple with, and my favourite approach is because when we go to these ancient sites, the, the traditional ways we go in um, normally with an Egyptologist and they will look at some of the, the symbols and the hieroglyphs and tell you about the construction of the temple, perhaps some of the wars that are depicted and this, this kind of thing. And we go in, take our photos and then we leave and it's on back onto the coach and onto the next site. But from my perspective, it, it makes me feel sad to just visit in that way. Even if you don't practice something like mindfulness or meditation, it's worth giving yourself just time, just time to sit and observe, see, like much like going to an art gallery, the um, amazing architecture and the contours. It's all been designed to have this kind of subliminal effect on the mind. So perhaps just if you're going to these places, just sit, just sit and observe and um, see how you feel because if it's anything like the effect it has on me, you will start to feel this very serene feeling, if nothing else. And if um, perhaps like Karen, something else. So I'd ask you, please just suspend your disbelief for a moment and, and just imagine, just imagine if, if you sensed the same thing that Karen did when visiting a place, what an amazing feeling it could be. And she says, my time walking through Luxor Temple was with a light heart and a heavy body. We started to walk from the entrance through to the back of the temple as if it was inviting the heart and mind, not the body. It took us some time to reach the rear of the temple because we walked slowly through step by step. And it was extremely emotional and breathtaking as I'm sure our hearts were opening every step of the way. I was conscious of not taking the experience for granted as I was at the mercy of the grandeur of Luxor Temple, and it felt like we were home. And that's the kind of um, experiences that we can we can have there. I mean, I've, I've had, had amazing experiences, and I just love taking people to um, Luxor. The thing that I can't convey today is this kind of energetic feeling, the atmosphere, the sights, the sounds. Um, 
through many of the temples when when we visit them in Egypt, they're sort of filled with bird song. Occasionally, cats come out still and, and greet you at some of the temples, and it's this, and they're almost kind of uh, living still in a way, and that seems to be what the architecture tries to evoke with these different angles. It's like there's this kind of movement as as we walk through them, and as we know, a lot of this knowledge seemed to seep through in, into the the kind of Renaissance. It was a rebirth, and we can trace that information, a lot of it certainly back to ancient Egypt and the the Gothic cathedrals, which are still visited obviously by millions around the world because of um, their amazing architecture. Well, all of this we can trace it back to Egypt, and we are very fortunate still to be able to visit these places. And I'd certainly encourage. Everyone, if you thought about going to Luxor Temple, um, please go and, and drop me a line. I'm always interested in people's impressions and feelings. Thanks for your time.